Hi all, I have another mega exciting notable game to show you today. This is of Lajos Portish playing against the great Tigran Petrosian, who is of course a former world chess champion. Lajos Portish playing white in this game. He was born in April 4th, 1937. He's 78 years old, Hungarian. He was born in Zaligarska. He I'll put that in the description of the video. He won the Hungarian Championship for the first time in 1958, and in 1961, he became a Grandmaster. In 1960, he qualified for the Madrid Zonal, uh, for the Stockholm Interzonal, in 19, which was to be held in 1962, where he came equal ninth. In 1963, that's four years before this game, he won the Hal Zonal ahead of Borislav Ivkov and Bert Larsson, and advanced to the Amsterdam Interzonal in 1964 where he came 8th. Over the course of his career, he qualified for the candidates 8 times and played for his country in 19 consecutive Olympiads. So it's a fantastic Olympiad player from 1956 to 1996. Amazing. Uh, he had another fine tournament finish, equal second with Tegran Petrosian after Anatoly Karpov at Milan 1975. At the Bill Interzonal 1976, that's the year of this game, he qualified again, equal second with Bent Larson, and went on to win the Portish Larson candidates quarterfinal 1977 match. Um, sorry, the Bill Interzonal was 10 years after this game, not not the year of this game. Uh, okay, so yeah, he's very, very experienced player. And one of his greatest uh, Interzonal, um, not Interzonal, one of his greatest team events... Uh, he led the Hungarian team to an unprecedented uh, first place finish ahead of the Soviets in the Buenos Aires Olympiad of 1978. So amazing Olympiad player in particular. So let's see. Anyway, in 1967, in the Moscow tournament, playing white, he played d4 and Petrosian played d5. c4 and Petrosian played the Slav defense. Very solid, reliable. Opening the exchange variation, c takes d5, c takes d5, knight c3, knight f6, knight f3, knight c6, and here we see bishop f4. This bishop might be slightly better than black's queen's bishop, especially if black locks it in. Well, you could make the argument it's slightly better. And if black takes it out, then there's pressure on b7 sometimes. So in live book, actually, uh, it is taken out frequently here with bishop f5, but in this game it was kept in with e6. We have e3. White enjoys uh, some control of e5 here, but it's challenged. Bishop d6, and White doesn't want to have structural damage inflicted. He drops the bishop back. He doesn't mind so much this because there's some h file pressure. Tegram Petrosian castled. Bishop d3. Now rook e8, as though one day e5 is going to happen, maybe after taking e5 at the right time if white castled. So a lock and key was placed on the e5 square. Now sometimes you have to be very wary about the idea behind this. This is a really, really interesting idea. A lot of players would reject actually playing the obvious move. Knight e5 to lock down e5. Obviously, Tegram Chosen is geared up for e5. But this obvious way of blocking it, doesn't it suffer? Positionally, because if you have to support your e5 pawn, you end up playing f4, and you weaken e3, and you weaken also this diagonal. And this is exactly what is demonstrated here, because Petrosian played bishop takes e5. After d takes, knight d7, f4, this diagonal is weakened, and we have moved queen b6 now. Is this a good position? What would you play here? Fantastic dynamic idea and very, very simple when you see it. I'll give you 500 points actually if you play the move that Lajos Portis played. And I'll deduct 500 points if you don't, if you play some other move. I'll give you five seconds to think about this position. What would you play here with white? Okay, white simply castled. If he played to just defend the pawn, this is going to lead to really bad stuff. If you played to defend the pawn, knight c5, black's got good control of the light squares coming up. 
Now something like rook d8, and black's just better. He's playing for d4. Black's just simply better. You've got no attack here. Your bishop's driven off the attacking diagonal. Lose 500 points. Let's try and learn the dynamic aggressive school of chess here. You just castle here. You give up e3. It's a tempo gain of that queen. Let it come in. Let it take the pawn. Not only that, remember that white potentially is going for d6 here. It's slightly weak and afforded by that advanced e5 pawn. Nice outpost square. Petrosian did take on e3. Check. King h1. And now took his queen back. What has this e5 pawn done though? It's dislodged the knight on f6. It's also supporting a knight to d6. But uh, this element means h7. Why not just go for h7 here? At least drive a knight back to f8. It looks secure though, doesn't it? The knight protecting h7. What is this? Have we just sacrificed the pawn for nothing? Build up on h7. Rook f3 is played here. And it looks as though these pieces are loose. Why not queen takes b2? Well, we could then just move the rook. In the game, Trojan played knight g6. But let's have a look. Queen takes b2. This knight's immune, actually. We could just move the rook. Because queen takes, we have bishop takes h7, winning the queen. <clears throat> so it would help white build up, actually, for maybe something like f5 coming up. <clears throat> Not only that, I mean, these, these ideas remain knight b5 to d6. But okay, at the moment, uh, Petrosian's response to rook f3 wasn't extra greedy. With queen takes b2, it was knight g6. Um, also, it has to be noted that if he, if he plays another move, say say he plays another, if we play a token move here, white's going to really arrange a tempo game, bishop f2, and then zap black with bishop takes h7. Here, yeah, this is uh, bad for black. So yeah, black has to be careful. So the move Petrosian played here looks like a good defensive move, knight g6. Petrosian, of course, has a reputation of snuffing out any counterplay before it's even conceived, or any attacks before they're conceived. He rarely lost games, very rarely lost games. But here, he's under fierce attack. The bishop f2, gaining a tempo for switching the rook in on h7. Queen d8. But uh, here... Before black can stop a knight coming to d6 with, with, say, a6. Knight b5, getting into that d6 square. First installment, knight d6. And it also, of course, has some influence on f7. Now, Petrosian, famous for his positional exchange sacrifices, played actually bishop d7, hoping perhaps for knight takes e8. But this is an attacking piece. It's part of white's attack infrastructure. He didn't play it. If he plays it... It's a small advantage for white, but it's going to be a game after, you know, knight takes, pardon me, after knight takes, queen takes, it's still going to be a bit of a game. Black's pretty solid, actually. And black did snatch a pawn earlier, so it's an exchange attack for one pawn, actually. If it becomes two pawns, then it becomes really difficult. Trojan's actually won a few games. Definitely the exchange attack for two pawns. So anyway, no, this is an attacking piece. Let's respect it. Bishop h4, pinning. Very annoying pin here on that e7. Very annoying. And now black played queen b6. But we now have rook h3. Yes, it's pretty direct stuff. Putting pressure on black sensitive points. A lot of pressure and how does black actually try and defend this threat being bishop takes e7 or even more subtle ones uh, let's see by the way if black had played um, instead of queen b6 knight takes h4 well of course well not of course let's just have a look bishop takes h7 is mating mating here yeah, this is a mating too can't play that knight takes f7 mate there or queen takes f7 on f8 so yeah we see this queen b6 rarely has Petrosian you know had to defend this sort of position 
look at how many white attacking pieces there are. And this is from an exchange Slav. Is the exchange Slav such an aggressive system? We have h6. And now, can you see the move white played, which kind of spelled the end for black here? What would you play with white in this position? A great attacking move to undermine the defences. If I give you five seconds, can you beat a former world chess champion from this position? Okay, Bishop F6 undermining the structure here, trying to get in for a mating attack. Black has nothing much to do here. He took on B2, hitting the rook and trying to get onto the back row. But now rook F1, and it really is a desperate position. This is just going to be absolutely murderous if G takes, you know, with the queen crashing through. Uh, threatening check and a mate, you know, this knight still hanging around there, as well as other possibilities. But uh, we see knight f5, but now just bishop takes f5. And Trozian resigned. 24 moves, he was blown away. Exchange Slav. Have a look at this final position. We'll put on a bit, sir. I'm pretty sure we might not need it <laughs> too much. takes it's a mate in four actually for the technicalities it's actually here well no it's actually a mate in three whatever black does uh, so we're threatening a mate in two with check and queen takes f7 if rook e7 now here we just play bishop takes g6 that's the most incisive okay and then that's end of game simple as that really black's got no defense now I thought this game was was interesting and intriguing. There's a very very simple idea that you can afford a temporary backward pawn, the pawn on e3, as long as you've got the idea of giving it away, not defending it or dislodging all your attacking pieces. So the idea of the backward pawn was not to uh, reduce white to total passivity. No, you just want to use it, throw it away, use it as a tempo gainer, install attacking pieces around the opponent's king. It's made to look really easy, and this is from an exchange Slav. I don't really want to create an interest in the exchange Slav particularly, but I'm tempted to use it now after watching this game, the exchange Slav variation, with the idea of locking down on e5, accepting a backward pawn, sacrificing it at the right time if black's greedy, and getting a vicious attack. That would be my cup of tea. Is it yours? I, I got something from this game, I hope you did. Comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.